Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of FS X The World Tomorrow. And today we are very excited to have with us Dr. Shamsia Abdul Karim. Assalamualaikum Dr. Shamsia, how are you doing? Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh Umar, thank you. And uh, we, are, we are calling you, speaking to you from uh, Singapore. Uh, yeah. We'll, yes, all right. So before we go into the questions and uh, pick your brains a little bit, uh, could you give us a, a quick uh, background or introduction of yourself? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm basically my areas of work I've been, you know, um, um, I graduated from uh, UIA, uh, basic degree in Bachelor of Business Admin. And then I moved on to took up a PhD in Durham, uh, where I specialize in Wakaf and Islamic finance. And my career has been uh, mostly in Majlis Agama Islam Singapore, uh, Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, where I specialize in mostly in the finance area. So I did uh, Zakat. Uh, Zakat was, you know, uh, the first thing that I did. And then uh, I did the uh, Islamic investment, Wakaf, and uh, things like Baitumal and Faraid. And I moved on to, to Malaysia to, to head the uh, foundation. And also, um, I, I had uh, some uh, a very short uh, career in, uh, in the banking sector, looking at the Sharia division, which also... Um, uh, involved in the areas of zakat and wakaf, so I'm I'm very passionate about uh, the areas of zakat, wakaf, and faraid. That that has been my 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 area for almost three decades. So, Dr. Shamsia, thank you for your introduction, uh, and and it's really great to to speak to you about so Islamic social finance because many believe that it has a very key role to play, uh, not only today but moving forward into the future. Uh, for Muslims and for humanity. Uh, but before we go into that, you, you mentioned that this is your passion, right? So maybe uh, you can share a little bit how did this passion come about and why are you so passionate about it? I mean, I can see that uh, a lot of this um, through the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, collection of all the, the, the contribution from the public you can see that a lot of things can be actually uh, achieved eh? in, 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 in uh, uh, I mean, it, Global Sadaka has that crowdfunding. So it is a crowdfunding in the sense that all community comes and actually contribute uh, to elevate, uh, especially uh, on Zakat matters of poverty. So there are a lot of social, uh, social finance area that can be, you know, uh, can, can, can elevate a lot of the social problem in the community. Through, uh, through the act of zakat, through the act of wakaf. So these, these are all the, um, uh, the financing of the community through all these tools. And I can see the, 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 you know, the, um, the, the impact it can give, a very great impact that it can give through uh, galvanizing all the public funds uh, towards uh, contributing towards this, this cause. And uh, when the, the, the best thing is that when you see that um, things changes, impact, uh, uh, you know, uh, that there's impactful changes, uh, you, you get more excited, you get more, um, you know, to go uh, and, and, and do more uh, on this area. It, it gives you a solid sense of satisfaction doing it. Yeah. Okay. So, can, you, can you share uh, a few maybe specific examples of uh, good implementation of zakat or wakaf, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, just uh, if you look at the current situation now, you're talking about future. Uh, I started in 1990s when um, zakat collection that uh, during that time was uh, very manual, very manual, and. Uh, uh, so, say, sorry, doctor, you're, you're talking about the context of Singapore, yeah. Yeah, the context of okay. Singapore. Sure. Uh, context okay. of Singapore, uh, it's already very manual in 1990s. I mean, uh, personal computer just started, you know, in, in, in the <laughs> mid-90s. And we have, actually in Singapore, we are already, uh, we are a bit ahead because of the government uh, support and government initiative that strives for the cashless society in Singapore. So, um, if you look at, because MUIS was the step, uh, MUIS is a step board, 
uh, we are one of the lowest in the step board to actually implement uh, because they want to achieve 100% cashless uh, transactions in Singapore. So one of the big areas is actually on Zakat. So we can't achieve that because the society, the culture, cultural mindset of the society is that uh, when it comes to the payment of Zakat, it has to be, it has to be, you know, face to face. You have to uh, say the akad, and you have to have that human interaction. But if you if you look at the way things have evolved, especially in this COVID situation, um, that that's, that's no longer an issue. That's no longer an issue, and you have uh, zakat being collected in many ways and form. And this has actually uh, helped in a sense, uh, in terms of its collection and galvanizing people uh, to uh, when we have created that, that that foundation, it becomes easier for people to actually uh, do their obligations uh, even without being physically uh, appeared. So coming back to the disbursement side, how does it you know help actually? So that's the collection side. So at the disbursement side, uh, we also use, I think it's very important to also um, to also embrace technology. Embrace technology. When we started, uh, it was, uh, database is very important. Uh, that's why uh, a lot of the Pusat Zakat or the Zakat Authority, they have to invest in all this technology because it can, uh, it can actually improve the efficiency in the distribution. Uh, it will have less cost, one thing. It will have less manpower and it can be, you know, distributed uh, even easily. So what happened in Singapore, because it, it, it's small and it, it's, uh, everybody must have an account. So we started to open an account uh, for all the Fakir Miskin in Singapore. So uh, every Fakir Miskin must have an account. So because of that, we can actually um, transfer uh, the, the money every month. So they don't have uh, a period where you know they have to come to to the HQ, they have to go to to the place. To you, you, you mean the beneficiaries, yeah? Yeah, the beneficiaries. So uh, technology has actually helped in that sense, and even on Fidia, uh, the Fidia money. So when you when you use technology, mm -hmm. uh, we we created vouchers. So when when we give vouchers, uh, we send it by mail at that point of time, so they mm -hmm. can. They can, you know, um, uh, 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 I mean, uh, redeem their vouchers uh, at the shopping centers and so on, which is designated. So uh, it becomes very uh, easy for the the poor and needy to actually uh, receive all these uh, helps and aids through technology. I mean, through technology that we make it easier for them to actually uh, get all these benefits. So that is one technology. But I don't discount that it's very important to actually do a, 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 do a visit, governance and all that. So that is also one area that uh, I think um, a lot of the a lot, a lot of time uh, that is manpower constraint. And, uh, we need to have volunteers to see the, you know, uh, uh, the impact of that lah, uh, to help. Uh, the other thing I want to share is actually on WAKA. Uh, Wakaf is also something which is uh, very unique, and uh, and I'm I'm not sure whether other countries has actually uh, done such disbursement before. So I Dr. have Shams, yeah, so, sorry sorry to interrupt. Can you just briefly mention what Wakaf is for those who are not aware, oh, non-Muslims okay. maybe? Wakaf is actually an Islamic endowment where uh, the uh, it's an Islamic endowment. So where the capital are kept intact, and only the income or the usufruct from the capital are uh, being dispersed. So it, it is supposed to be uh, in perpetuity. So this, this uh, Wakaf, uh, Islamic Endowment, some say Islamic Trust, has been, uh, has been a tool for sometimes in Islamic uh, civilization, Islamic world. And uh, a lot of the Middle East countries started that actually, like uh, University of Al-Azhar, they, uh, they, they do an endowment, which is the Wakaf, to actually um, uh, fund uh, a lot of the activities. So uh, back back to Singapore when when uh, I was you know involved in the Wakaf disbursement. 
uh, it is unique because uh, to me that uh, a, a person from actually it is a uh, Yemeni, you know, who created the Wakaf Bank in Singapore. For example, Al Sagaf, the Al Haddad, the Al Junid, and so on. What they did was uh, when they created the, the the Wakaf in Singapore, the income generated from that particular uh, Wakaf or the capital is being disbursed uh, globally. So it 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 benefits a, a global you know a global uh, reach. Uh, it goes uh, all the way to the poor and needy in Saudi. The poor and needy. Uh, we have one that I did for a mosque in Indonesia, and then we have um, uh, in Yemen the mosque in Yemen, and then the poor the poor back in their hometown and so on. So uh, because Singapore is. Um, where you know uh, it's a safe haven for investment uh, it has created that uh, that uh, benefit for the beneficiary because for example a rental in you know in a particular area in singapore can fetch let's say ten thousand sing dollar and that money translated to indonesia will give a very good return for the beneficiaries in indonesia so that um, to me that 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 foresight of the the, the earlier uh, wakif has uh, has has brought about this uh, tremendous uh, impact. Uh. So um, wakif has been uh, uh, there and has been you know has been used to actually uh, create social um, yeah social impact to, to not just locally but uh, globally. Whereas zakat, if you look at it, a lot uh, are still uh, the fatwa is uh, being done locally. So distribution is uh, still very local in nature. Alright, so I, I guess that goes back to the the intent or the nature of the two different types of instruments or, or social yes. finance instruments. Yeah. The zakat is meant to be given back to those close to you. Is that true? Mm. Whereas wakaf yeah. is more open. Yeah, wakaf is more open. Uh, but zakat is also very, uh, it's a lot, the emphasis is on poor and needy. Is, is, is still poor and needy, but if you look at the hadith and the way uh, Wakaf was initially uh, distributed by Zainal Umar, what what he has done actually is uh, it's still along the line of the Asnaf Zakat where he gave to the poor and needy, the stranded, uh, yeah, to, 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 uh, yeah, basically the poor and needy and the stranded people. Uh. So this this uh these are asna which is also in the zakat, but I guess that was during that that time that these are usually what is needed. So uh, coming back to our our modern time, so what are the things that actually people need now? So that that is uh, also very, very important. For example, I give example which I'm uh, currently uh, in uh, in Pergas uh, heading the uh, Pergas Investment Holding. Um, we we did the you know uh, the Perkas itself. It's an association of the religious teachers in Singapore. Uh, they actually uh, use uh, the zakat money to under the Asnafi Sabilila to empower the Asatiza uh, to have skills, uh, technological skills, so that they can do their dawah. So these these are the you know things that uh, maybe you know last time you don't have that, but now. Uh, you need that, that that particular skill. So it's always an itch the heart when it comes to um, uh, the disbursement portion of how you should use your zakat money. So yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, one thing that you mentioned that that struck me is this um, culture, uh, embracing technology, and then conversely, how cultural mindsets can be a barrier, yeah. right? So, uh, and, and that's something that resonates very strongly with us, uh, especially with our work at Global Sedeka. Uh, we try to engage, uh, you know, with different religious bodies and individuals. And sometimes they're not used to technology or they don't see how it's relevant or important to them. And all this, you know, you can call it a cultural barrier. How, how did you go about uh, breaking this barrier, you know? And, and what advice would you give to those who are facing similar challenges in other countries? Of course, Singapore maybe is, is a little bit more uh, aware or more exposed to technology because the government itself is already very digitized, right? Yeah. yeah. Please share your views. 
I just wanted to share uh, uh, this uh, interpretation of the, you know, the way a religious interpretation of a certain rulings. So if you look at Zakat, uh, the Asnaf Amil is a, uh, Amil is a person, okay? and Amil is uh, uh, in, in the Quran usually used the masculine, you know, gender. So, um, so uh, during uh, 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 very, you know, in Singapore, there's 200 and Forty over Amil at that point of time, uh, over seventy about seventy mosques which we uh, we appointed across across the you know the country. So uh, I was uh, I was the head of zakat at that point of time, and I was uh, asked to deliver the you know the administration of during Ramadan, and this is what we are supposed to do. So I stand uh, in front of the whole auditorium. Uh, and there was this one question that they asked. How come the head of uh, Zakat is a lady? And Amir oh. cannot be a lady. <laughs> so it's not just technology. <laughs> the mindset was, you no, know, uh, only a, a male can be an Amir. A lady cannot be an Amir. So I was fortunate at that point of time, uh, the ex-Mufti, uh, Isa Smaid, the ex-Mufti, Saidi Sama Saidi Sir, he uh, he actually mentioned uh, you know he tried to defend the word Amel is actually an administration, and his definition was really very uh, very uh, even wider than just the gender part. He said it's an administration where it involves not just the person, but it involves the whole thing. That means the technology that you put in. So that's the cost that you can you know you can pay from from that particular uh, portion. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's the fatwa that we need to, uh, the ijtihad culture of the religious people that we need to uh, keep on um, engaging them and exposing them and doing research. I think very important if you do research and you give a very proper uh, presentation to them that this is how it should be done with reasoning and so on. I think uh, there should not be a problem and that barrier can be uh, actually uh, reduced because uh, I mean we cannot fault them because they are not in that particular industry. So that when, when you do not know something there's always that fear. There's always that fear that oh this is maybe you know uh, the money just gone you sure not the technology and now Uma is doing zakat on crypto so <laughs> <laughs> so is that what is crypto is it a legitimate uh, you know currency yeah. and so on so uh, it has to have a discussion a discussion on and 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 i think uh, environment and putting in people but i i think alhamdulillah uh, more and more uh, professionals, even the, 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 the Asatiza group or the religious group uh, uh, have been a lot of uh, seminars, conferences and discussion on, on those areas. However, we have to be careful also. The technologies in us, the, the professional in us, the entrepreneurs in us, try to push sometimes the boundary too far. And these are... These <laughs> too are far, also, too fast. Eh? Uh, too far and too fast. These are also sometimes very dangerous uh, okay. because at a point of time, maybe uh, it's not good to do that. It's not good. It's not the time yet. So you make them. You make uh, you create a, a more confrontational, defensive kind of mindset. Yes. Uh, yes. Correct. And then the other thing is that sometimes we don't see. We see. We see like oh, you know, this is you are very bad words. You don't know what is you no, know, but you don't see the harm. They look at the. Uh, they, they, they are quite, you know, after going through, when, when you are younger, you are like, why they don't, you know, why this is not allowed? Why is this, you know, you question, you question them. But then when you, you get, you know, wiser and so on. Oh, I think, yeah, we should have, we shouldn't be too, you know, uh, too aggressive on that area. You see, what happened to, to, to be, you know, to, to be on the middle path and to see the hikmah, very important, the wisdom of a certain uh, religious injunction is also very important. Sometimes the younger blood or the technologies in us would want to 
just push a certain agenda, which can be actually sometimes detrimental to the way it is done. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think this cultural issue, it's, it's a very big uh, topic yeah, when it comes to social finance. And I think your last point is a point that will, will do a lot of good for a lot of us who are trying to, you know, to create change, to remember that you, know, you can't just keep pushing. Sometimes you also need to uh, find a way to, to get them attracted or to get them to understand uh, and appreciate. Right? Um, this current situation with the COVID, I mean, moving on to, to the current situation and the future, uh, and also, before we end, I'd like to ask you about uh, a particular program that you started in Singapore, which is the Perlu program. Right? But before that, um, yeah, with the current COVID situation, it seems that um, there is this, this um, uh, instigation or this catalyst, in a way, that speeds up the whole process. Uh, do you think that we will see a lot of change in terms of uh, closing the gap between the more traditionalist, uh, you know, conservative a group of people that are still typically leading uh, Islamic social finance and the new way of doing things. Is, is, the, is the gap being bridged? Yeah. I think with this COVID situation, uh, there is like, you are forced already. The only way that you can do to perform your ibadah. So, um, and, and you can see that the, the religious uh, scholars and thinking has suddenly opened up. Suddenly mm -hmm. opened up. You see that fatwa on, uh, say, uh, the solat Jumaah, uh, they have allowed for, because of the situation, five people, like uh, 12 people in Malaysia. So it has always been like, you know, if you don't have 40 people, you can't have the solat Jumaah. So mm -hmm. it, it has shifted a lot. It has shifted a lot. And it is unprecedented, the shifting of the ijtihad, the religious scholars. And uh, we see that uh, now technology is like, well, we have to do it faster. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have uh, some of these things uh, in place. So we got to catch up with, uh, because the situation uh, now warrants us to, you know, uh, to force us to go into these cultural changes. Uh, I give you an example in, uh, but there are still people, the, the, the you know, the, I mean, uh, the older generation where they are not used to embrace technology. So we have calls um, in Pergas where, um, because we can't go out, can you actually collect the zakat from us? Can you come to our house and collect the money from us? You know, things like that. They are, they, because they don't embrace technology, they are trapped. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, secondly, the, uh, the, uh, when, when I see, uh, we, we open a counter actually, a physical counter. So that's, that's also, uh, you know, to cater for the older generation. But going forward, I think um, the older generation, either they, they are really being left out and this is also very scary because they, they do, not, do not know how to embrace the technology. And it has affected some, it can affect their Ibadah as well. I am sure this year, a lot of them who does not embrace the technology has missed out on the payment of their Zakat, especially Zakat Fitra. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be quite... Um, a serious yeah, thing. It eh? can be quite serious because uh, they they don't know and they don't have an outlet uh, to 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 do this. So this 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 are some very uh, issues that you know that the uh, the current situation has uh, forced us. But nevertheless, it is change is uh, like Robin Sharma mentioned. Change is difficult in the beginning. It is messy uh, in the middle, but it's beautiful in the end. So now is the messiness, you know, situation where, uh, of course, the younger generation they they, they are used to all these uh, gadgets, and technology, QR code, and so on and so forth. But um, it has to um, there should be effort lah, to bridge this gap of the older generation. But nevertheless, I've seen um, with this COVID situation, everybody is forced. Everybody yep. is forced uh, to use technology. 
Right. Now, this, this beautiful outcome that you mentioned, uh, what can it look like? What should it look like? I mean, with, with um, more effective uh, mobilization or implementation of Zakat and Wakaf, how can Zakat and Wakaf bring a better future for the Muslim world and also for humanity? I mean, it's a big, big question, but yeah, if you could just share some thoughts. Yeah, yeah I think what we have done uh, for Global Sakata, uh, Umar, uh, is something that should, uh, it has opened up uh, a new way of doing uh, this uh, Zakat and Waqaf uh, differently. Uh, it has actually uh, created uh, a more transparent system, more transparent system, and people like this transparency, this, uh, the governance, they see they contribute and they see who they are con contributing to, who are their beneficiaries. Before this, it, it, it's very close. It's very close. The most you get is a reporting. You don't, maybe once in a while, they show on TV that there's hampers being given. and that, That's about it. But with this, uh, you can reach out more and the beneficiary can also come forward. They are now, uh, they have an avenue for them to actually, you know, uh, being informed because of this technology advancement. Uh, now we know that there are, you know, the, the, the group of poor in Nigeria, in this, in, you know, everywhere that it can be, uh, it can be helped, it can be utilized. In Indonesia, you see a lot of villages still, you know, uh, needs help and so on. So, uh, Zakat and Wakaf, I find that, uh, that, that uh, it's, uh, it's a blue ocean there because um, because uh, there's there's still a lot of things that uh, has has not been uh, I mean uh, ventured into and, and there's there's a lot more that can be done actually so this this COVID thing and the future for this area of zakat and wakaf um, the transparency the efficiency especially you will see that the admin cost can also be reduced. Because the larger group that you can reach out with uh, lesser administrative costs, which is uh, quite a burden before this. If you are a small zakat collector, no way you can actually, you know, uh, do your zakat. Uh, without, Sustainably. Yeah, yeah sus to, to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. so, uh, right. so this, this, this has, you know, opened up doors now. Right. And, and with so much uh, suffering and so many problems and so much pain today because of the COVID and, you know, for potentially a, a prolonged depression, large, long period of unemployment, high unemployment, uh, what can Wakaf do potentially in this, uh, you know, in this situation? Yeah, okay. Um, coming back to, you know, uh, we started the, I mean, Pergas, uh, Esmen, Pergas, uh, you know, uh, created this uh, so-called Perlu Fund. So uh, this is for the legacy of ulama. So we started an endowment. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important. One thing is for the sustainability of uh, whatever activity that you want to do. So you need to create an endowment so that whatever, uh, this is very important for organization. I mean, it's for organization, is very important. So that whatever mission and vision that you have, you can continuously do it because you already have planned for your capital and the investment that comes with it. So it is not like, you know, uh, true. Uh, how, how does it work? Can you give a bit more detail? How does Perlu work and similar models that can be implemented following Perlu? Okay, uh, this is also a cash wakaf concept uh, where the uh, it is uh, endowment when people donate, we don't actually disperse the donated money uh, immediately. And this is uh, very different from Sadaka, the general Sadaka, and, uh, and also Zakat. Zakat, you have to distribute within the year. So it is a different way of uh, you know, uh, 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 a funding mechanism. One is an endowment funding, one is a, a Zakat in donation where you, you it is like a fiscal policy where every year is a tax system where you have to disperse for the people in need at that point of time. But uh, but this this particular uh, fund it is actually for uh, for it to grow and so that it can sustain the um, yearly activities of that organization. 
So if you look at many many um, organizations, uh, uh, the, you know the non-Muslim organization, uh, they already have many foundations that they, they uh, endowment that they, they created, mm -hmm. things like Harvard, Yale, uh, especially universities, and uh, they have in 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 the regions of billion of dollars mm -hmm. and. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the religious organization in, for example, I get example in Singapore or even in Malaysia, uh, they don't create an endowment. They don't create an endowment. So every year it's a struggle to raise funds. Mm -hmm. Every year it's a struggle to raise funds because they don't have that uh, income stream. For an individual, it's like a passive income stream that you give, uh, you know, that you can generate that, that particular. So that, that's the fund that uh, I, I'm talking about. Uh. So that, that's also very important for, for, for an organization which wants to, wants to be sustainable in this mission. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I, I, I get the idea. And uh, I think uh, this is something that should be implemented on a wider scale, you know, not only on a larger scale, but on a wider scale. Uh, because, uh, as you said, this creates a, a sustainable source of income. And instead of spending a lot of uh, time and effort every year looking for new uh, sources of funds, uh, they can utilize that time to do more impactful work right, and to improve uh, the activities within the organization. All right, Alhamdulillah. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it also actually expanded the, uh, the investment, Islamic investment fund. Because the capital has to be invested, so you are in, uh, you are you are uh, creating you know economic activities, Islamic economic activities through the creation of this endowment. Because you have to invest. Yes, 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 definitely. I think that there's another very very good point not to forget. Uh, before we end, um, just some thoughts uh, about today and the future. There are a lot of young people who who will be reading and uh, watching this uh, this uh, video this interview, uh, how do you see, where, where do you see the opportunities are for young people today in Islamic finance or Islamic social finance? Just uh, ending, let's end with that last question. Um, I think in, in Islamic finance, as uh, you can see, it's been very well. It's not just banking, but uh, there's this area of, you know, uh, actual, uh, actual trade and investment and so on. I think that that's where we should be uh, really looking at the real economy. If you look at the situation now, you know, with, uh, with increasing debt and uh, I think if, if you look at many of the, um, the, the sophisticated uh, instruments where it's like, for example, derivative and all that, I don't think that that kind of, you know, is sustainable. So um, there, there are a lot of opportunities for the younger generations to look at uh, the areas of uh, these areas, especially on Islamic finance, how it can actually help uh, the people, uh, the people to you know uh, to to create uh, this this economy. So uh, the real economy is where I think we should concentrate on food security. Mm -hmm. With you know real economy, we are creating. Um, goods and services and you're creating jobs, it's very important. And of course, uh, to me, uh, social finance, uh, it's, it's, you know, whatever you do, you have to do good. So, um, mm -hmm. doing good is, you know, the balance uh, of, of, of the society. And if you can see the, the, the way society, you know, uh, with this COVID situation, it is also a sign. <laughs> I thought it's a sign that you know people should uh, should 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 reflect back and, and and see that you know that there are a lot of people that is also in need. And I hope this this uh, this incidents this phenomena that we go through give us a, a very strong reflection on on there's a lot of people that we need to help out there. And the the young generation embrace technology definitely. You need to have multi skill. You you can no longer just specialize on one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, right. I think that's the <laughs> message I can give. Very good message, and you'll do. Uh, you know, those who listen to this message, you know, hopefully, inshallah, they will also pick it up and uh, strive forward in trying to do good while also uh, developing themselves to be able to do more good. 
So with that, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shamsia, for your time, for your insights, and uh, for your sharing. Uh, I know there's a lot more that that we can uh, gain and learn from speaking to you, but we are out of time. So inshallah, maybe we'll have a second session. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Omar. Yeah, thank you. Assalamualaikum. All right. Waalaikumsalam. Take care.